Wow, there's so many good scriptures today to preach on. In Matthew, we're in the in the third part of Jesus' teachings. Um, you'll remember that Matthew has five different spots where Jesus is teaching. Remember the Sermon on the Mount in f uh, chapters 5 to 7? And then um, uh, sharing with the disciples in chapter 10. And now he's doing parables and and Matthew uh, puts a bunch of parables in chapter 13 so that we can get a flavor for what Jesus is doing as he's teaching in the villages in Galilee but we're not there today we're not going to go there amen amen because we are in a sermon series that we've all been following along faithfully which is a series on oh praise the Lord Amen. Now, I asked Father Gene this morning, just as kind of a, uh, you know, just as kind of an orientation to what we need to be doing today, what is, what's our, what's our key verse for Romans? And I think, uh, well, he said, well, I don't, I don't know if we picked a key verse. I said, you know, like a key verse that we would all memorize and just to kind of sum up what Romans is talking about. And, well, you know, I don't know if we've done that yet. So he said, he said, we thought we'd leave that up to you, Bishop. <laughs> um, my suggestion for Romans key verse is 5-1. Chapter 5, verse 1. It's a therefore, just like today's therefore, okay? So Paul is concluding his arguments uh, in chapter 3 and 4 and gets to 5, 1, and he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's pretty, that pretty well sums up the majority of the argument that Paul is giving us in Romans. Amen? So that would be a good verse for you to memorize. Now I know all Anglicans have memorized John 3.16 but it's good to get out of your you know, habits a little bit and memorize other verses too. Amen? Oh, I wasn't very heavy on the amen there. But that would be a good one. It's, it's really good. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That is the gospel that the apostles have been preaching. We now have peace with God. God has acted for us that we can be in relationship with him again and that comes through Jesus Christ because we are justified by faith in Jesus and we have peace with God. That's a key verse, I think, for what we're doing in this series. Mining the depths of Paul's theology and um, then we get to chapter 8 <laughs> and Gene says, I said, chapter 8, I said, uh, you could do like four or five sermons on chapter 8. He says, no, just one week, just one week. So I'm going to do the first part of chapter 8, and he may, he may slob over into the end of chapter 8 next week, even though he's supposed to do chapter 9. I'm going to do the first part, and we looked at that uh, this morning. We heard it proclaimed, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so once again, uh, Paul is kind of summing up what he's been talking about for the last two weeks, chapter 6 and chapter 7. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are we in Christ Jesus today? Okay. So therefore, there is no condemnation. We have been justified by faith. And we have peace with God. Okay. Praise the Lord. That's how we have to live. That's how we have to live. So there is therefore no fear. We shouldn't be fearful about things. 
Um, there's, there should be no shame about things. And if there is fear and shame and those kinds of things in our life, then we need to use the good old tools uh, to get rid of that stuff because God stands ready to cleanse us from all that. Um, and cleanse us so that we know that we've been cleansed. Some people, you know, kind of inch in and say, oh yeah, I know the Lord loves me. But. And I think Paul's saying, therefore there should be no but. Okay? Therefore there should be no but. Because, because Jesus has stepped in to cleanse us and he's baptized us in his Holy Spirit. Okay? And and we should know, we should have the assurance in our hearts of his love for us and of his desire to transform our lives, to set us free so that we can do those things that he wants us to do. Amen? Okay, so the faith that we have is given to us by God uh, freely through Jesus Christ so that we are now able to follow him without uh, remorse, um, without any secondary thoughts. Um, sometimes there's things holding us back. We need to give that over to the Lord because the Lord has created us for his purposes. He has not created us for our purposes. Amen? Um, sometimes, though, we get that wrong, and that's why we have a book of alternative facts. <laughs> um, that's why we read out of that book every week, alternative facts. Reality, reality, right here. Amen? Mm, love it. The, you know, the Orthodox are always kissing things. They kiss the icons. They kiss the Holy Bible. They kiss crosses. And a little tradition is, after the gospel is read, the bishop, the deacon will kiss, or the person reading the gospel will kiss the gospel. Um, just as a, as a sign of honor and a sign of love for these words. If the bishop happens to be there, he'll kiss it because he's going to preach about it. Um, and these words are life to us. Life to us. Um, and um, our society has just kind of shoved it up there and, and we don't want to hear it because it has some pretty tough things to say to us. He's saying to us today, do not live by this flesh. This is all that Jesus has done. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by our flesh, the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen? Now we know what it is to walk, and, and a little later on, you know, he's going to say we are created to resemble Jesus. Okay. But the Spirit is in us so that we resemble Jesus. And this is not just for the bishop. Although, you know, of course, the bishop is going to resemble Jesus if he's walking in the Spirit. What does that resemblance look like? Galatians 5.22, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's because it is the law of the Spirit. The Spirit wants to form in us Jesus. So that when people see us, they see Jesus. 
And we, can, we cannot be doing that if we are following our own desires and our own plan for life. Only if we're following what the Spirit would have us do in our life. Amen? Now Jesus took that sin upon himself in the crucifixion and destroyed it so that we could live by the Spirit and the Spirit could form in us the image of Jesus. So Paul just keeps going on. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. To set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, there's a problem. There's the zombie factor. The zombie factor. We have died in our baptism. We have died to sin and risen in the power of Jesus. But there's Boris Koloff in the background. Oh no, we love some things. We want to return that way. And there's this zombie back there. And the issue is we can't go back there. We've, we've killed the flesh, hopefully. Spiritually we have, and we've risen in Jesus. Ah, but there's this, there's this active flesh thing that's still going on. And we have to deal with it to put it to death. So we have been saved, we have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. We have that new relationship with God. He pours out His Holy Spirit in us and we're ready to go except for the body that we're in. Which wants to return to the dumb stuff of the old life. And so we have to put it to death. That's our Christian life. We're called to now, because we have a new perspective on life, we're called to serve God in His Spirit. And we're called to get rid of the junk, remember the junk, that the old life has. Do you remember what that is? Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual, this is Galatians 5.19. This is before 5.22. He hits us with the bad news before he hits us with the good news. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Okay. That's what the old stuff is about. Now the Spirit gives us the power to live anew in the fruit of the Spirit, in the character of Jesus. And so the Spirit is constantly tapping on our shoulder saying let's go this way let's do the love peace faithfulness gentleness thing but we're screwing up in two ways we're trying to build up an old steam of faith in the flesh and let them have it right because that's justice we think but Jesus is talking about a different kind of justice, our relationship with God. And he's trying to pull us back into a new way to do things and to confront things in love and peace and goodness and gentleness. Amen? 
That's hard for me. I don't know if that's hard for you. That's hard for me. Okay? And, and so that's why it takes a constant checking in with the Lord and a relying on the Spirit and singing, singing, singing and thinking about spiritual things so that, so that we can manifest that life of Jesus here again. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Good news. Amen? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And because if we're in Christ Jesus, we are living a life of repentance, of forgiveness, of renunciation of these evil things that Paul has talked about to the Galatians in a list that's pretty comprehensive but seems to go on and on and on but we're new we're made new so then brothers and sisters we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So there is work for us to do. There is work. There's discipline for us to be involved in. Spiritual disciplines. Prayer. Uh, scripture reading and study. And other things, too. So it's not like everything's done for us. Well, everything's been done for us, but we have to live into that. We have to, we have to say that we want to do that as well. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry Abba Father now for me this is a crucial part of today's scripture the spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are God's children and if children then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And this is an important thing that we miss. We think that we, because we have the Spirit and we have the gifts of the Spirit that we're something special. We are something special in God's eyes, but we are special because we have a channel directly to him him who we need to obey. Amen. Obedience is the key to Christian life. Obeying God and what he has for us. And so this Abba, Father, these words come out of Christ Jesus' relationship with God. When Christ comes among us as the, as the true icon of God, okay? In other words, if you have seen Jesus, you have seen God, okay? And so the words here that we, we read every Sunday when, when the deacon comes down into us, it's Jesus coming in now we don't necessarily think of Jesus and Sandy together at the same time or what maybe we do but it's Jesus coming into our midst 
to speak to us his words. That's why we stand at the gospel. Okay? We don't stand during the Old Testament. We don't stand during the epistle. That's important scripture too. They're not different. But when the gospel is read, because it's Jesus' own words to us, we stand. Jesus is here. Jesus is talking to us. Okay. He's present. He's present in his word. He wants to be present in our life. And, and we want to honor that. And we want to truly worship him. Amen. And that, when, when Jesus is, is praying to the Father, he's using that Aramaic word, Abba. Um, I, I would translate that Papa, Papa. A little different than Daddy. Daddy's a little too English, too contemporary. Because there, there's authority there, but there's an unbelievable loving relationship there. And so when Jesus is among us, he's trying to help us see that this is the relationship that God the Father wants. God the Father wants this close-knit relationship with each of us, which we now have through the death of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. Amen? And, and we waste that because we're concerned with our things. And Jesus says, don't be concerned with your things. Be concerned about your relationship with the Father first. Amen. Jesus, uh, the, the, the specific crucial dynamic moment where Jesus' relationship with the Father is at its most difficult stretch is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where Jesus says, Father, Matthew, Luke says Father, right? Matthew says, My Father. Okay? It's Abba. If you'll take this cup away from me, that is, right now would be a good time to do that. Alrighty. And so that prayer, Abba, Father, that worship, that relationship, is stretched at that point. Because what's needed at this point is God's will needs to be obeyed. And that's true for us too. We need to be about obeying God's will for us. Because that's why the Lord has chosen each one of us. He's chosen each one of us to be his agents in the places where we are. In the places where he may send us. Amen? Amen? Now, had you told me when I was growing up that I was going to be a missionary in South America? I don't think I would have understood that. I didn't know that much about other cultures. Latin music for me was Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. That's about all I knew about Spanish culture, which of course it's not. <laughs> okay. Had the Lord said to me when he, when he told me, I want you to be a pastor, that to do this, I'm going to send you to Ecuador first. No, he didn't even, he didn't put that in there at all. I said, okay, Lord, I'll follow you. If you want me to be a pastor, I'll do that. Um, how it was clear to me that this is the way that the Lord was leading step by step by step. And when that time came, there was no, 
there was no doubting, no presumption, no, mm, I don't want to do this. I said, okay, we'll try it. <laughs> oh, baby. There was all kinds of bumps in that road. Especially when the bishop said, I don't want you to go to language school. Um, I want you to come here first and we'll find something for you to do. So he sent me to the Universidad Católica in, in Quito. And I, I did just a, like a typical language course. Uh, six weeks, th meaning three days a week, one hour a day for six weeks. So then I knew about six words in Spanish. <laughs> and then he said to me, all right, you're going to be in charge of the church in Cuenca. Ten hours south of Quito by car, half hour by plane. It's easier to fly in the Andes. I said, uh -uh. you're kidding. This is impossible. He didn't seem to be wavering at all. So off we went to Cuenca. Lord have mercy. So, the issue is, are, are we ready to obey God? Are we ready to obey Him when we don't see what's going on, when we can't see but like three or four feet in front of us? Because God is calling each of us to do His will and to participate in sufferings for the kingdom of God. We try to um, anesthetize ourselves from sufferings. It's impossible. It's impossible. This, this old flesh, as you know, won't let us do that. Okay. And if that's true on the physical plane, it's not true on the spiritual plane as well. But we must maintain our lifeline by the power of the Spirit to the Abba Father so that we can joyfully do what He's asked us to do. Amen? He's calling us to greater things. To greater things than what we can imagine. Because He's involved in it. And He's faithful. And He's trustworthy. And He has forgiven us and welcomed us into His family. Paul is asking us to live into that. Put aside the flesh and live in the Spirit. The, a lot of contemporary folks are saying, well, well, we just have to love everybody. We just have to love everybody. And, and love is good. Amen. 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 But I think this, this verse uh, in Galatians chapter 5, a little bit before those two other verses where we talk about what the flesh does, what we talk about living in the Spirit does, it says this. Paul says to the Galatians, but I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Unfortunately today, everyone wants to gratify their fleshly desires. Okay. Now, we don't have to be mad at them, be mean to them, or anything else like that. But this verse here, Galatians 5.16, is is our way to live walking by the Spirit and not gratifying the desires of the flesh. God will give us the power to do that. He's already done that. Are you sure that you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your hearts and minds? Because we need to be assured that God is for us. And if He is for us, there is now no condemnation for those who live in Christ Jesus. Amen. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.